1MDB has sparked embezzlement and money laundering investigations across One of the biggest countries. corruption scandals the world has ever seen. What may be the biggest financial scam in the history. Of corrupt 1MDB officials treated this public trust as a personal bank account. Follow us as we bring you into the courtroom where the biggest financial scandal in Malaysian history is being heard. By the Malaysian Insight, this is the Najib Razak 1MDB trial and I'm Patrick Teo. Over the past few weeks, we've heard from former 1MDB CEO Sharul Halmi about how he carried out instructions, no questions asked. Today, he testified that two years after the deed, he finally asked Najib, the question we all have on our minds, where's the money and how do we get it back? But the only answer he got was, ask Joe Lowe. On September 25th, 2009, the newly formed 1MDB Petro-Saudi joint venture company signed an agreement, an agreement that meant it would inherit a loan of 700 million US dollars from one Petro-Saudi Holdings Cayman Limited. Petro Saudi Holdings is a shell company incorporated in the Cayman Islands that mimics a legitimate entity called Petro Saudi International. Mm, well, think of it like buying a new house, knowing that it was haunted. Chances are, nothing good will come out of it. Sharol, who is the prosecution's ninth witness, said that the deal was struck before the joint venture was officially formed, and it was signed by one man on behalf of both sides. The man was Tariq Obaid, the former CEO of Petro Saudi. In what looks to be a pattern with Sharol, he said that he never questioned this strange arrangement. Why not? Because he knew that there was time pressure to formalize the joint venture, the witness told lawyer Shafi Abdullah. He knew that the JV was important to Najib and that it was crucial that absolutely nothing, not even a dubious 700 million US dollar loan, should delay it. But in hindsight, Sharul said, he should have obtained a copy of the loan agreement and brought it up to 1MDB's board of directors. The board, it seemed, had no clue and would not have agreed to it had they known, the witness admitted. Hindsight, as they say, is always 2020. Sharol testified that he had felt assured that it was okay to bulldoze their way through to formalize the JV because it was a government-to-government -government deal and involved Najib's personal relationship with their Saudi partners. He also trusted in Casey's, quote, superior experience, unquote, in the legal field, he said. Casey, who was Joe Lowe's close associate, had been appointed to lead the charge for the JV. Furthermore, the witness said, working in Team Najib meant that you would work in a silo. You were only given information about your own task and would know nothing about what the others are doing. Sharul said that each individual in the team was indirectly prohibited from going beyond their own silo. Therefore, he said, he just did whatever was tasked to him at that point of time, no questions asked. Who gave those instructions? Shafi asked. Najib gave Joe the responsibility of managing the details so that Najib wouldn't have to worry about them, Sharul said. The witness said that he did try to ask Najib about the loan two years later, but the former PM told him to ask Joe, but he never did, because Najib's answer further discouraged him from being a busybody. Shortly after this, Shafi told the judge that he needed some time off to go to hospital. He had an appointment with an eye doctor. The judge allowed this, and court was adjourned for the day. This podcast was brought to you by the Malaysian Insight. The team behind the Najib Razak 1MDB podcast are Revati Supramaniam, Yap Pek Kwan, Yvonne Lim, and Ravin Palanisami. Timothy Acharyam provided additional reporting. And I'm Patrick Teo.